are coming to you live from Seattle this morning. Beautiful, sunny Monday morning. <laughs> I'm going to be teaching the next hour. This is going to be an introduction to, I don't know, Freud and Mark's class. Next to me is my wonderful wife, Jeneline, who is my partner in teaching crime. <laughs> Jeneline will be providing the voice of common sense in this highly abstract theoretical class. And whenever Jeneline feels like it, Jeneline teaches a Friday class. Um, so make sure that you don't miss those when those start again. <laughs> I just want to say a very quick thank you to all of our patrons who keep these classes going. You guys are amazing. Mm -hmm. My dream is to keep these classes free forever. The goal is to make philosophy and theory accessible, entertaining, without dumbing it down, if possible, <laughs> to sort of keep them quite complex. And it's really because of our patrons that we're able to do that. So thank you to our patrons. If you'd like to become a patron, please click the link in our um, Instagram bio or our YouTube about page. The Patreon gets you access to our Discord server as well as bonus content for every single class. Plus, if you want to listen to all of these classes as a podcast, um, you can find that on Patreon. Okay, I think we should just start right in. Yes. This is going to be a class where we focus on, I said it was going to be like a fashion issue and there's going to be some fashion elements here, but bear with me towards the end, we'll be more explicit about what Lacan says about fashion. Um, but anyway, if you're joining us for the very first time, the basic idea for these classes is that it's not a transfer of information. I'm not trying to get you to write notes or anything. Essentially, it's a, um, a dialectical class, or if you're less inclined to call it dialectical, you could say it is somewhat associative, which means that we're going to go through a whole bunch of topics, and by the end of the class, hopefully, it will make sense to you why they fit together. This is also part of an overarching series, which uh, is the Meaning of Life series, which I've also called the Hermeneutic Temptation, and I think we're in, like, class five or five. six. Mm -hmm. So if you like this class, you can actually look back at the previous five classes to see the same themes developed in more detail. However, every class is standalone, so you don't need to have any previous knowledge of any of the classes. And one more plug, important plug. I'm going to be releasing a book at the end of October. It's going to be called The Hermeneutic Temptation. That book is going to be available exclusively to our top tier patrons. So if you would like to pre-order The Hermeneutic Temptation, please go to Patreon. Uh, that's coming pretty soon, which is nice. Excellent. Okay. I'm also sp sporting my Seattle shirt, which I want to show off to everybody here, my Sonic Boom shirt, which I think is pretty dope. Yeah. Okay. Shall we just start? Let's dive right in. Yes. I feel like it's appropriate for a fashion class. That you be well, it's not gonna be a fashion class as such, but okay, let's a just fashion class exactly. <laughs> yeah, let's we'll, we'll start. Um, that there will be a fashion element here, we will be talking about some of those things. Okay, so Freud has this kind of funny statement which is about religion, and basically, in this class, I want to do a bunch of parallels between Freud and Marx and why it actually makes sense to read them in tandem. And Freud has this funny idea about religion, which he says that he's talking about the unconscious, first of all, he's talking about the unconscious, and he says that. In religion, you actually have a better life than in psychoanalysis. That religion is less extreme than psychoanalysis. Why? Oh, someone says that there's no sound. I don't know if that's... If you have any problems with sound, let us know in the comments and I'll try to change it. So Freud says that religion is less extreme than psychoanalysis. Because he says that in religion, you're always responsible for your actions, your thoughts, etc. right? If you're a religious person, especially if you're a Catholic, you're constantly in this like libidinal economy of your actions. You have to weigh them against whether or not you've done the right thing to get in heaven mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and Freud basically jokes, he says that psychoanalysis is more extreme than Catholicism because in Catholicism, you're responsible for all the things that you do. In psychoanalysis, you're responsible for all the things that you don't do and all the things that you don't say and all the things that you don't think. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you're taking responsibility for the negative space that is inhabited by yourself, mm -hmm. what Freud would call the unconscious. And it's really important to point out here that the unconscious is specifically not the subconscious. Why is that? In part, it's because it's not that there's a layer of meaning hidden beneath the ego. There is no a subconscious level that you're supposed to dig into that you can then blame things on. This is how it would be if it were the subconscious. You'd say, well, yes, I'm being an unpleasant person today. I'm being an asshole, but I can blame my subconscious. My subconscious is somehow making me do this against my own will. 
For Freud, that's totally, there's no get out of free subconscious card. Get out of jail free card. (laughs) There's only the unconscious, which is in a sense a negative space created specifically by your actions. It's Mm -hmm. It's not a negative space that comes before your actions. It's a negative space that exists within your actions. This is also sort of um, why Lacan basically says that like the unconscious is the discourse of the other. Anyway, we're going to explain that a lot more in a lot more detail in this class. Don't worry. I know this is a little bit abstract. Um, another figure who had a little bit of a wisecrack about religion was Marx. Now, of course, Marx famously was anti-religion and called religion the opium of the people, etc. But if we dig a little bit deeper, uh, when Marx writes about commodities, Marx actually compares the commodity fetish to the idea of religion, and not entirely unfavorably. Because he says what happens with the commodity fetish is that we've basically detached the commodity from its means of production. And we've created, again, to use this word, a libidinal economy in which we invest emotions into that commodity. And this, for Marx, is essentially how religion works as well. We've disinvested our actions from the practical circumstances of being in the world, and we've invested them, quite literally, in the abstract relationship and hierarchy governing whether or not we get into heaven. Mm -hmm. And so for Marx, the commodity fetish is actually similar to what he would, in a sense, I mean, it's an, he doesn't say this himself, but you could say the religious fetish as such. And so it's not just that Marx is against religion because he thinks that religion is sort of like, you know, bread and circus, opium of the people. In his more nuanced way, he's actually pointing out that one of the things that religion does is it actually takes you, and I'm not saying like religion to court, but for Marx, that religion can take you out of the, the value structure of your world and basically defer value onto an abstract place, which is heaven, which is also how capital functions in a sense, right? Capital always functions in a way where you've detached it specifically from its use value and you've made it about its like, uh, it's what is it? Exchange value. Exchange value. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And so this is, this is sort of what he says. Now, obviously this is not a theological critique in any sense, but that's sort of how Marx develops it. And, and it's a, as much as I like Walter Benjamin, Walter Benjamin actually doesn't do this as well. When Walter Benjamin writes religion, a capital as religion or capitalism as religion, he's more crass because he basically says that capitalism functions like a cult. So he sort of has this pet peeve about how religion functions. And then he says, well, religion is bad and capitalism is bad, which it's a, it's a great essay, but, but it's not, it's limiting in that sense because it has that prejudice. Whereas Marx is looking more at the structure that governs the logic itself. This is also always what Marx and Freud are both doing. Marx and Freud are always interested in the way, not in which the manifest content is there. It's not saying this is good or bad. It's looking at the question, why does it materialize in that form in the first place? We're going fast, so I'm going to like <laughs> kind of rein it in. But there's, there's a whole bunch of things that, that I want to talk about. So Jenlene and I are in Seattle, and one of the one of the things that makes Seattle a great city, as you can see on my shirt, is a lot of record stores. <laughs> and one of the one of the uh, famous record labels here, so famous that it's almost like a little bit of a joke, is the record label called Sub Pop, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, what they released Nirvana, right? For yeah. example, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so Sub Pop Records, and and any sort of self-respecting, card-carrying Freudian should look at Sub Pop and be interested in the word sub here. Sort of like in, in, with the sandwich chain, Subway. <laughs> and, and, and Sub Pop is specifically from what it comes from originally, subterranean pop. It's the idea that it is a pop that is of the underground. By now, of course, Sub Pop Records, it's part of the mainstream. Mm-hmm. For Freud, this is what happens as soon as you make anything sub. As soon as you say that something is sub, you're going to actually then make it mainstream. The unconscious is that which persists because it is not avowed. The subconscious is always disavowed. The unconscious, if it were unpop, it's that which persists in music precisely because you've disavowed it. (laughs) Now, why is that important? It's important because if we're saying that you can't, that the unconscious isn't something that exists underneath a layer, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, sub pop, we have the idea of pop, which is mainstream. And then we have sub pop, Mm -hmm. the underground. Mm -hmm. And you want to sort of commoditize the idea of the underground. What Freud realizes much better is that it's not a relationship between top and bottom, between something being above ground and something being subground, subterranean. 
It's that the unconscious is the disavowed content that emerges within the mainstream itself. And I'm gonna explain in more detail how that works in just a moment. I love the we, idea of there being like an alternate record label. You could have sub pop and unpop. Unpop, yeah. <laughs> unpop, unpop would be punk. Yeah. Because punk is like the like disavowed stepchild yeah. within <laughs> all mainstream music, I think. Or for a long time, you could say it was blues music within rock music, etc. Mm -hmm. There's always like that that musical genre that is disavowed within the popular <laughs> genre itself. Yes. Also, Jenlene, if, if you want to come in at any point, you're welcome to. I know I'm going fast, but like that's <laughs> the like whole it. point is that you can break up the... I'm catching up. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's early morning here. It's like 8 a.m. Um, we were actually out really late last night because Jenlene and I watched... The Extended Two Towers in the cinema. I like how sparse you are with your words. It's beautiful. It's great because like I'm just like a torrent. I'm trying to think about like I'm what's just... the most salient detail. No, no, it's about great. It. I'm like a torrent of of like speech, and I love that you boil it down to like the basic enunciation. Yeah, we saw the extended edition of the, the Two Towers in cinema. Yes, which is great. Um, okay, so anyway, I, we can talk about the Two Towers another time. So Lacan has this idea, which is that the unconscious is the discourse of the other. Which is already, and in order to understand that, you already have to understand why the unconscious is specifically not the subconscious. Mm -hmm. The subconscious would imply that there's a layer of consciousness beneath your daily actions. And that, in a sense, you could blame that space. And for Lacan, the unconscious actually emerges as the negative space of social relations themselves. Mm -hmm. And in a weird way, you could almost say that the unconscious wouldn't exist without that symbolic formulation of the exchange with others. The discourse of the others. And I'm going to give you three examples of how we can sort of positivize this lack, mm -hmm. as Lacan would usually put it, uh, through three different stories. And three different stories that can serve as popular examples, hopefully. On the one hand, we have, which Lacan himself analyzes, but I have a different take on this. Uh, we have Edgar Allan Poe's The Purloined Letter. That's the first one. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have Maupassant's uh, The Necklace, uh, which is a short story as well. And this one you know, I think, I mean, you may know the other ones too, mm -hmm. but this one you know more immediately, which is P.J. Wodehouse's short story, um, Aunt Agatha Takes the Count, mm. which is also <laughs> turned into one of the TV episodes mm -hmm. with, um, I forget what his name is, Hugh Laurie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have three stories here. We, and, and I want to start with the purloined letter. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the purloined letter, it's one of the few Edgar Allan Poe detective stories mm -hmm. in which we have the detective. I think his name is Dupont. Mm -hmm. That's okay. This, <laughs> yeah. I worry that... I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, excellent. <laughs> that's good. Okay. I don't know to what extent. Like, I'm repeating things that are totally obvious. <laughs> no, I feel like this is totally new for me. I think I knew that a gal and Poe was in some ways responsible for the earliest detective stories, but I didn't know that that was the story that it's attributed to because I never really associated with detective yeah, I mean, there's a couple of really great ones. I think mm -hmm. there's three. One of them is with, like, a monkey that steals a child at night through a window. Like, there's gothic <laughs> elements. But yeah. what's nice about mm -hmm. the, so in the purloined letter, it's a basic plot device mm -hmm. with a twist at the end. And Sorry. there's a plot device with a basic twist at the end, which is that there is a, uh, the queen is essentially being blackmailed uh, by, we think, a minister with a letter that she's written with her lover. And basically mm -hmm. this lever has all this this letter has all this incriminating evidence about a love affair that the queen is conducting. And so the police is called to find this letter. And uh, Dupont, the the famous sort of detective is part of this investigation as well. And in the end, spoilers for the poor line letter, <laughs> spoilers for <laughs> stories that are 200 years old. In the end what we have is that the letter is found by Dupont. And he finds it in plain sight. He goes to the minister, who's an enemy of the queen, and he basically looks simply in the stack of letters that is on the table, and the address has been wiped out. And 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 um, Dupont basically says that you know the police were looking for a hiding spot when it was hidden in plain sight. And and for La, for Lacan, for Lacan, the letter is a form of positivized lack. In other words, the letter. We don't need to see the content of the letter. There's no plot device in the letter itself. It's almost like a MacGuffin. In fact, Lacan says that the letter is a character in the story. In a sense, the letter is the lover. Everything revolves around the tension of finding the letter. 
personally, I think that this is actually an insufficient interpretation or analysis of this story. I actually think that Lacan's getting away with a little bit too much, too much common sense here and pretending like it's a lot, um, with a lot of language. Because I have an alternate take on this story, which I think would be, which I think would be actually even more in keeping with Lacan's theory of positivized lack. What if the letter never existed in the first place? What if the entire thing where the queen says that, you know, she's being blacked by, by, letter, by the letter is itself a political game? And the letter has never been written. The letter doesn't exist. She's using the idea of the letter to incriminate the supposed blackmailer of the minister who can't do anything since the letter he's being accused of having doesn't exist. And Dupont solves the crime by producing a letter. Because when Dupont produces a letter that doesn't exist, now the queen has to pretend that that is indeed the letter that she's speaking of. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? So that would be, a much, to my mind, a much more satisfying way of looking at the story, which is the letter never existed in the first place because it doesn't have to. It was, in a sense, a pure floating signifier. And the way that you solve the crime would be to produce a letter... And now the queen, in order to keep up the fantasy, has to then say, yes, this is the letter. Can you spell out more clearly what you mean by positivizing the lack? Yeah. How I mean, the letter functions as that. Because well, I think that's where you lose me. Okay, I'll try to do this. We have three <laughs> examples of the same thing. <laughs> okay. um, <clears throat> there's always a negative space, remember from the last class, which mm -hmm. has to be counted as one. Mm -hmm. And this is, for example, the idea of the castration complex. The castration complex isn't to say I'm afraid of losing my member. It's saying that I have it and yet I feel like I have lost it. We have here the opposite. We have something counted as nothing. And the innovation that Lacan makes through Freud is to say we have to have nothing which is itself counted as something. Okay. This is also why Zizek has the famous... Um, uh, Nonochka joke about the coffee without cream, etc. It is specifically with without cream that the coffee is being presented. We have to take the emptiness and positivize this. Now, Lacan sees this as happening in the purloined letter because he says that the letter doesn't reveal its content. In a sense, the letter is pure letter and all of the action flows around the letter. But Lacan's not being extreme enough here. Technically, if you really wanted to positivize the lack, the lack of letter, quite literally here, you would simply say that there was never a letter in the first place and that to solve the crime would be to retroactively produce the letter to, in a sense, suture in a Lacanian yeah. sense of the whole story. Okay. Does that, no, that Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Does it help? Yeah. Okay, so, but don't worry. We have two other examples here that will hopefully help a little bit more. You know, there's also the Zizek joke, which I've mentioned in these classes before, um, about the man who's uh, conducting an affair, and he says that he's going to go and play billiards every Wednesday, but while he's doing billiards, he's actually doing somebody else. Yeah. And then the affair doesn't work out, and now he has to actually do something every Wednesday, and so he goes, <laughs> he goes and like plays has billiards. To play billiards. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, yeah. like that joke is a little bit how it would be here. Yeah. Um, you okay? Yeah, yeah. It's just very early, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. You, you don't have to be here also, but I yeah. like I love the fact that you are here. I, I get self-conscious about this because every once in a while we get haters who accuse me of forcing Jelena of being here. And this is patently not the case. You're my own free will. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, I hate that I have to like specify this, but like, okay. Okay, so the second story that we have is the Maupassant story of the necklace. And the Maupassant story is one of those beautiful little vignette stories that have a nice little twist at the end as well. And it's about a, a relatively poor lady. So, I mean, not like a beggar, but someone who's of the middle class, essentially, who wants to go to a ball. And she can't afford to buy the clothes to go to the ball. And so she receives a small amount of money from a friend and buys herself expensive clothes. But she doesn't have enough money to buy herself jewelry, which would be sort of part of the whole ball experience. And so her friend loans her what she thinks is a very expensive necklace, a pearl necklace. And she goes to the ball, mm -hmm. etc. And she comes home and she's lost the necklace. And so what she does is that she basically then goes to a jewelry to a jeweler and buys a replacement pearl necklace. 
and spends all her money and debts herself for the rest of her life so that she can produce the pearl necklace and give the pearl necklace back to her friend. Years later, she's on the street. She is now actually a beggar because she has like impoverished herself by buying this necklace. She comes across her friend who she hasn't been in touch with for the past years. And her friend says, oh my God, look at you. What happened to you? you you're, like, you're living in total poverty. What happened? And, and she finally confesses. She says, I lost your necklace. And so I bought a necklace, which was like, I don't know, $10,000 or something. And I've been living in poverty ever since. At which point the friend screams and says, but didn't you know that the necklace was fake to begin with? And so she gave her a <laughs> fake necklace, which she then felt like she had to replace. And she sort of indebted herself. You know, this here. is one of my all-time favorite short stories. It is so beautifully written. Oh, so this yeah. one you actually knew? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, it's um, her husband is like a is like a bureaucrat and is trying to advance in his profession. And she borrows the necklace, I think, from her employer, who is a wealthy woman. And then she sort of ruins her life, cleaning and toiling, trying to repay this debt, only to learn that all along. It's a great reveal. It was fake. Yeah. Yeah. It is mm -hmm. really good, isn't it? It's very mm -hmm. painful. It's a very painful story. And, yeah. like, there's multiple, like, I think, like, movie adaptations and stuff as well because it's just such a good story. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to progress to the third positivized lack story that we have here, which is the P.J. Wodehouse story, uh, Aunt Agatha uh, Takes the Count. Um, I always am inclined to think, like... I know this is not the case, but I like to think that Aunt Agatha is like PJ Wodehouse's way of getting back at Agatha Christie, <laughs> especially because she's like she's like the worst detective. Like she always like assumes the wrong motivations about people. <laughs> and so in this case, and this this is a PJ Wodehouse story with Jeeves and Wooster, mm -hmm. which was famously turned into a TV series with Hugh Laurie and uh, Stephen Fry. Yes, quite a wonderful series. I really enjoyed it a lot. And um, so in this particular episode, it's one of those con man type scenarios and there's a con there are two con men a con man and a woman who are trying to con Jeeves who's a wealthy aristocrat um uh, and this is basically the con I'm not going to explain no sir but this is the con they give him they want to loan money from him essentially they want money and as a security for that money they give him a box containing a pearl necklace mm -hmm. saying we will give you back the uh, once we this is a security for the money. So if we don't give the money back, you can keep the box with the pearl necklace. Now, immediately you would think to yourself, maybe the con is this. They're just going to abscond with the money and there is no pearl necklace. But it's more cl clever than that. It actually functions much more according to the logic of how I read the pearl and letter. It's that they return the money. Mm -hmm. They say, here's the money that you loaned us. We're doing our part of the deal. And then you open the box and you realize that the pearls are gone. In other words, they say, you've lost the pearls. Now you have to buy us back pearls. And so in the end of the exchange, in this con, which I think uh, the character is Slippery Sid or something, <laughs> in the end of this exchange, you've gained a set of pearls that have been legally bought without actually using any of the money that you were given as an investment. Right. And so in a sense, it's like the perfect crime because it's like a legal crime in mm -hmm. the sense. It's a, it's, a, it's a fraud that implies no con other than the fraud itself. And this again is another version of the positivized lack. You are giving them not only a box without pearls, specifically, you are giving the person the ownership of no pearls. And because they own no pearls, they have to substitute those pearls. In a sense, the con forces PJ, uh, not PJ, forces the character, the mm -hmm. aristocrat, into doing what the woman in the necklace story had to do. Right. Which is, now it's not that she's replacing fake pearls. Now he has to replace pearls that never existed in the first place. Yes. So now Wooster has to buy pearls for his aunt. Yeah. he detests. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, the yeah. story has a twist where mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Fry or whatever his name is, Jeeves, mm -hmm. is able to secure the whatever. Yeah. There's a whole yeah. thing that happens to resolve the fraud. But it's it's sort of nice because we have here essentially three ways of looking at this empty space, at this sort of the, the empty thing that structures or conditions social relations around it. We have, mm -hmm. on the one hand, we have um, the purloined letter where... Uh, in a sense, Lacan says that the letter itself is meaningless. It doesn't matter what's in the letter. Everything is structured around the letter. Mm -hmm. 
to my mind, we could update that story and make it even more interesting by saying that the letter is only ever produced by Dupont to fill in an emptiness, but Lacan doesn't quite go there. Um, then we have Maupassant's The Necklace, where the real value of the necklace never existed, but had to be substituted. Um, and then finally, the P.J. Wodehouse one, where there is no necklace in the box. And it's because there's no necklace in the box that the person who's being conned has to, in a sense, insert the necklace, has to pay for that necklace. And so in each of these, we have essentially what Marx would refer to as the commodity fetish. Now, why is that? It's because people usually misinterpret the idea of the commodity fetish. People think that the commodity fetish is simply when you imbue too much emotional value into objects. It's like, oh, this object is just a lump of metal. Why are you treating it as a sacred crown? Mm -hmm. That's how people usually think about the commodity fetish. But this is strictly speaking not what Marx is interested in. Marx is not telling you that you should be more in touch with your world and your inner self and that you should, you know, not invest so much into sentimental objects, etc. That's, again, this is, that would be Marx working on the level of the subconscious, saying in a sense, oh, this wasn't me, I did it for the object, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What Marx is saying with the commodity fetish is specifically, and this is sort of the formulation, is that it's not about social relations among people. It's about social relations among things. And here you can already see how, like, actually how Freud and Marx are much closer than you would expect, because all of those three letters, uh, all of those three stories we're looking at are specifically stories in which we're talking about social relations determined by things. We have the purloined letter, in which the action revolves around the absent letter. We have Maupassant's The Necklace, in which the action revolves around the missing necklace that has to be substituted. And Wodehouse's con is the con of the pearls that weren't in the box in the first place. And here is, we're much more in the realm of the commodity fetish again. It's not saying, oh, none of these things actually have value. It's the fact that the ambiguity of how the absence or presence in that dialectical fashion of that value is structured not through any imminent value in the thing itself, but specifically th is refracted through social relations. And that is what the commodity fetish is. And so the commodity fetish is never just to say, oh, don't you realize that pearls are simply, you know, things that were found in the sea and you wear them around your neck, etc. It's not the demystification of the commodity never occurs on the level of the content of the commodity. It always occurs on the level of the form of the commodity. In other words, how these social structures create a sense of abstract value within the thing itself. And this is like super important because I think that today there's this idea that the commodity fetish is simply, oh, you're too into stuff. And if you're a minimalist, you're somehow fighting the commodity fetish. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that I think Freud would have understood perfectly is that you can be a minimalist and be more of a commodity fetishist because now you've structured all your social relations around the things that you don't have. I have a list of things that I don't have. And now... It, through minimalism, you've essentially become, and this is how Lacan would then reply to Marx, is you basically committed the error of Don Giovanni. Don Giovanni, who's famously pursuing all the different types of women, I mean, in a sense, he screws everything that walks or moves, mm -hmm. and it's like old women and young women and women with like a hooked nose, and like it's this like taxonomy of, of love conquests. And what he doesn't realize is that Giovanni is, in a sense, not chasing women. Don Giovanni, is it Don Giovanni? Yeah. Don Giovanni is chasing the list itself. And that's what minimalism does. Any Lacanian will see that this is the, at the core of minimalism, which is that Lacan always said that the ascetic, right, the person who detaches himself from earthly things, cannot detach him from one thing, which is his attachment to detachment. In other words, the ascetic becomes denial embodied or disembodiment embodied. And that's exactly what minimalism is. It becomes the fetish of not owning things. Now, is that preferable to owning a bunch of useless things? Sure, fine. But at that point, you'd be at a normative analysis. You'd be saying this is either good or bad. Well, it's a critique of consumerism rather than the ideology of capitalism. Yeah, the motivations and the conditions of consumerism. Mm -hmm. But on the level of the commodity fetish, the commodity fetish persists even when you are disavowing being a consumer. 
And that's exactly sort of the uh, Zizek's emphasis on like epor si move. And this is also why, again, we are back at the level of the unconscious and not the subconscious. Remember, the unconscious is not the thing that is underneath consciousness. It's not the monster under the bed. It's specifically the thing that persists even though it shouldn't. And that's much more uncanny in a Freudian sense. The thing that moves even though it shouldn't move. The thing that once you've gotten rid of all the excess it is yet still there. The classic tale, the classic E.T.A. Hoffman tale that marked, that Freud writes about in The Uncanny is, and I've mentioned this before, is this. It's the man uh, who's been in a fight, blah, blah, blah. He's blinded another man. And this blind man is chasing the man who can see. And no matter where the seeing man goes, the blind man follows him. And so finally, the, the, uh, the person who's being pursued goes up into a bell tower, thinking that on top of this bell tower, at least I can see this guy coming from everywhere. He's not going to see me. He's going to be looking for me. The blind man is going to be looking for me in the crowd. But I'm in the bell tower, and I can say one thing for sure is that the blind man is never going to be able to spot me in the bell tower. And so he goes up the bell tower, and he feels like he's finally at ease. He surveys the scene. It's like a, a let's imagine like a market scene, right? People, little ants walking, like little ants walking around. And he sees the blind man sort of looking around the crowd. And then suddenly the blind man goes, and he points his cane and looks straight up at the bell tower and goes, <laughs> and it's so fucking terrifying. And that's exactly how the unconscious works. The unconscious is not the thing beneath the surface bubbling up. The unconscious is the thing that persists in the very act of resisting it. Because you resist it, it comes into being. It is itself the excessive substance of that which is being disavowed. And that's much more terrifying. That's much more uncanny. This is also the idea essentially where like, and, and it's also important to say like, this isn't just a bad thing. It's not like Marx is saying like, you have to detach yourself from the unconscious. You couldn't do that in the first place. It's your, de- you're wanting to detach yourself from the unconscious that brings it about in the first place. It's also, um, this is like a deep, deep dive, but like Zizek, Zizek has like a million examples of this as well. One of them is, uh, in a classic patriarchal society, the man is supposed to ask the father whether or not, you know, he can be with the mm-hmm. daughter, not just like, can I marry her? But like asking permission to go out. And then the father at a certain point goes on a trip, like a business trip. And suddenly they can't go out anymore because they realize that the only way that they were able to formulate going on a date was to ask the father for permission. If the father is gone, then what's the point of going on a date? I mean, it's, it's dumb, sexist, blah, blah, et cetera. But like, again, the obstacle becomes part of the thing itself. The perceived obstacle is itself part of the thing that you are, mm-hmm. that you are having. Does this still make sense? I know I'm going very yeah, well, fast here. Yeah, it seems like there's a difference between the obstacle being integrated into the story and the obstacle. So and we actually, yeah. can I just briefly, so everything we talk about in these classes, I kind of give you hints of it in the previous classes. Mm-hmm. So in one of the previous classes in this series, we talked about um, the operatic, uh, the opera buffa trope mm-hmm. of the, um, what is it? Necessary the, precaution. The nece- well, no, it's the unnecessary precaution. Yes. So it's in a sense, uh, no, th- what is it? The irrelevant precaution? I need to get, get my Italian right here. It's the... Useless precaution. Useless precaution. Thank you so much. <laughs> this, is, this is wonderful. I love it when you help me out of the way. So yeah, the useless precaution. And so what happens in Oprah Buffa, sorry if I'm repeat. if you watch the series, sorry if I'm repeating myself, but I'm just giving you an insight into like how this cl- these classes are structured. Mm-hmm. In the Opera Buffa, there's the idea of the useless precaution, which is that the hero wants to achieve one thing. Like let's say the lover wants to be with his beloved and there is someone who wants to prevent this from happening either the father or the jealous uh third party Mm -hmm. and the third party the jealous figure will do all these things to try to prevent the two lovers from meeting and it's precisely because those two lovers are prevented from meeting that they come together in other words part of the comedic effect is that it's always the thing that is supposed to hinder the outcome that creates the very conditions for the outcome. And that's what's so enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Now, um, if, you, if you think about it, like this is also at the heart of like all British comedy. Uh, Stephen Fry has actually talked about this quite interestingly, that British comedy is simply the fact that it's since the antithesis of American comedy. American comedy is optimism. I can do anything. Here's a guy who shouldn't be in this situation who is imposing his will nevertheless. Um, 
walking into a fancy restaurant and being himself, etc. British comedy is the exact opposite, which is it's always a character who believes and aspires towards a better life and finds his hopes dashed, in a sense. He wants to be able to do everything, but he can't do even the basic, most simplest things. Um, and this is even, what's beautiful about British comedy is, like, the level of humiliation runs so deep. Like, there's, there's, there's an old Mr. Bean episode where Mr. Bean has this perfect fantasy, which is, like, the most... If you lived in the UK, you know that this is, like, the most British experience of going to the park during a lunch break and having a sandwich that he's perfectly prepared. Like, the most perfect English sandwich that he wants to have. Cucumbers, etc. And how he sort of miserably fails to enjoy having the sandwich. <laughs> you can Google it, Mr. Bean sandwich. It's beautiful. Um, this is also why there's this expression, which I think rings very true, that the British are the only people that can experience schadenfreude on their own behalf. <laughs> That is part of British comedy. It's the enjoyment of their own, at, at, at their own detriment, in a sense. Which is different from self-predicating, self-deprecating. Deprecating. <laughs> it is self-predicating in that sense. It is not self-deprecating humor. It's not false modesty. It's not saying, oh, I'm comfortable enough to make jokes about myself. It's exactly the opposite of that. It's saying, I am so uncomfortable that my very non-joke being becomes a source of comedy. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is like a riff. <laughs> I hope that's okay. <clears throat> but the important thing here is this. Um, and this is something that like Zizek has gone on about as well, but anybody who studies Marx and Freud will sort of be aware of this, is that we're always trying to investigate not what is the secret meaning, not what is the hermeneutic temptation of the spectacle, but specifically what structures the underlying logic of it. For example, in a Hollywood movie... Um, this is actually kind of a funny deep dive here. Alain Badiou, who is uh, probably one of the most well-known French theorists today. Um, Alain Badiou uh, supposedly told Zizek that one of his favorite movies is Armageddon, and uh, which is kind of funny. And that this is even worse, that when Alain Badiou was coming up with the concept of fidelity to the event, which we've talked about in detail in previous classes, loyalty to the event, that he was specifically thinking about Armageddon, which is great. Although in classic, Bajou, Zizek would just do Armageddon, whereas Bajou has Armageddon in mind, but never admits to it, which is sort of beautiful. Um, but what happens with a lot of these Hollywood movies, for example, you could think about E.T. is actually about a marriage mm -hmm. that is on the rocks. Armageddon is about a father reconnecting with his child. Um, even like you could look, I don't know, Star Wars Rogue One uh -huh. is like, mm -hmm. it's all moving towards the fact that they can be on the beach together and be reconciled, etc. That we have these elaborate movie plots with lots of action and spectacle. And at the end of the day, they're simply about reconciling something which is disavowed, something mm -hmm. that cannot be reconciled. Mm -hmm. Now, a notable exception to this is actually the film that we saw yesterday, which is The Two Towers. Mm -hmm. The Two Towers doesn't work, or at least Lord of the Rings doesn't work like this. The idea of, you could say, of course, that, you know, it's a metaphor for um, uh, World War I, etc. But, you know, this is very, very interesting to me because Tolkien himself was avowedly against the use of metaphor. This is one of the surprising linkages between uh, Tolkien, Susan Zontag, and someone like Paul Salon, <laughs> the uh, German poet is that they all despise the use of metaphor and the idea of figuration and analogy. The ring doesn't stand for something. We're not trying to say that Mordor is capitalism. We're not saying that there's a direct overlap between two different things. And in this sense, Tolkien is very much in alignment with Marx and Freud. We're never just reading the, the dream content as being, this means this. You're dreaming of unicorns because you want to have a penis on your head. That's specifically not how it works. In the previous class, we already talked about this, where we said that, like, to say that something is phallic is not to say that it is in the, in the specific shape of a phallus. Mm -hmm. and, and for Marx, it's also not saying that the commodity form has any deeper meaning as such. You're always looking into the structure of the social relations of it. The same is true for Tolkien. Tolkien is saying, nothing in my world is a metaphor for something else. It's specifically about the structural relations that I'm trying to point between what creates human bonds, etc. Um, Susan Zontag had the same thing, which was against metaphor. The irony is that when we look at books today, most literary critics look at the quote-unquote quality of the uh, visual imagery being used, that the metaphors, are the metaphors cliched or are they interesting? Mm -hmm. and in are they original, yeah. Yeah. But part of being against metaphor is also to realize that language is itself metaphoric. 
that as soon as you are putting things into speech, you're already symbolizing. And that this isn't necessarily something pleasant, that this is like a torture house. Lacan refers to it as a torture house. Um, using, I mean, prison house, torture house, I've done this in other classes, I don't want to go into much of a rift between Heidegger and Lacan, etc. What's interesting here is that Zizek, actually, this is where the rift becomes part of the class, just saying. Zizek has referred to poetry as a form of torture. Not because it's torturous to go to a poetry reading, although I'm sure some of you have had that experience. Not all poetry is good by means of being poetry. Of course, what is good, right? We can have a whole debate here. Poetry is a form of torture because you're essentially trying to take communication of words and you're trying to make it escape from the, let's call it, natural expression of communicative exchange. And you're trying to make it fit into something which is a fixed form whether it's rhyme, whether it's, I don't know, whether it's the structure you're using, whether it's a haiku. And it's not just the formalism of saying, okay, I have to make this fit. It's specifically also saying language should be doubling back down on itself. Remember like 10 weeks ago, we talked about Beethoven and how Adorno said that Beethoven is the process of music, in a sense, composing itself. And I mean, that sounds very abstract, but go back to the Beethoven class. It's like a one-hour <laughs> explanation of what that means. Um, not to be self-indulgent, I hope. This is like, self-indulgence is a crime. We need to avoid this. Like, better to masturbate than to be self-indulgent, I think. At least when you masturbate, you're investing indulgence in an imaginary something. <laughs> self-indulgence is like purely ordinary. Anyway, that's the whole thing. And so, Zizek says that poetry is a form of torture. And it's funny because like, what he's essentially, the, the type of torture, if we were to say, what type of torture is poetry? Essentially, poetry is Procrustean torture. No? What is Procrustean? Ah, oh, thank you. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Ascend, and you mean Procussive? No, no, pro no, no oh, not okay. Pro Procrustean. Okay, so Procrustus is the, um, it's basically the, uh, it's a smith within Greek mythology. And you may have heard this in like, uh, like horror, horror tales, etc. And the idea was that he had an iron bed and the iron bed was a fixed length. And if you lay in that bed and you were too short, oh, too tall or too short. he would yeah. stretch your limbs on the rack. And if you were too tall, he would come in at night and chop off your <laughs> limbs to make you fit the bed. So when we say that something is Procrustean, we usually say that it is trying to fit within a formal structure, contain something which cannot fit within it. Now, it's actually funny because in the purloined letter, this is where you start seeing how this class is structured. Within the purloined letter, um, there's actually a comment that the detective Dupont makes about how he solved the crime. And he says that it was because the police was being Procrustean. Mm. They were thinking within a certain type of structure and he was able to look outside the structure and to realize that actually the letter was hidden in plain sight, which is for him going outside of the Procrustean frame. It's actually a joke about this in the Two Towers, the Lord of the Rings that we watched yesterday. So Merry and Pippin, spoilers for the Two Towers, <laughs> Merry and Pippin want to con Treebeard into taking them to Isengard so that he will see the devastation of the trees which is classic Walter Benjamin, because Walter Benjamin writes that the only way to convince somebody to take action is not to logically convince them, which the hobbits have already tried, but to show them the content of the destruction itself, which, which is very anti-Freudian, very anti-Marx, where you shouldn't, should resist the hermeneutic interpretation. Anyway, so Merry and Pippin try to basically pull the Benjaminian move, which is, well, if we can't convince Treebeard why he should wage war on Isengard, we're going to show him, we're going to trigger him, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> and and the joke that they what they use is they they use actually the same kind of Procrustean logic there where they say you should bring us to Isengard because the closer we are to danger the further we are from harm. And Treebeard even goes in the movie. Treebeard even says, "Hmm, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but I guess <laughs> you know what I mean." Like there's that that inversion, and that's sort of what Dupont's doing as well. Is he's saying like it was hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, there's so many examples of this. You have like the keep your friends close, but your enemies closer, mm -hmm. those types of inversions that take place. Okay, so we're finally going to arrive at fashion soon. We've had a bit of necklaces, but that's it. <laughs> now, it's funny because the idea of Procrustean, right? The idea of something fitting a pre-prescribed frame. Lacan actually has a really interesting description of fashion. And it seems like a, 
it seems like a diss. It seems like he's anti-fashion. But I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. And I don't know, this is like my own take. So I don't like, like I don't publish things, but this is like in verbal form. If we did a deep dive into one thing Lacan said, you know, there's all these articles that are like, I'm going to take one word from Capital and do like an extensive exegesis on this. Um, so Lacan basically refers to fashion as being quote unquote procrustean arbitrariness. And this is really kind of interesting because like he's being deliberate here. And in a sense, he's being deliberate because Derrida was already using the idea of, was fixating on procrustean and what it means to have language being confined by something. When Lacan uses the word procrustean, he's being very deliberate because for Lacan, all signification is procrustean. It's in a sense a structure that emerges through its own articulation. It's the symbolic chain that has to be closed. In a sense, we all act like procrustes. We all have to, in a sense, be able to to stop that. And so when Lacan refers to fashion as the procrustean arbitrariness, he's, you would think at first that he's saying that what is essentially a tautology, something that is procrustean when it's, when it is arbitrary. For example, the measure that Procrustus has for the length of a bed is arbitrary. It's not like he has some like divine measure of what the perfect size of bed is because that doesn't exist. A bed should suit the person who lies in it. And in the same way, it's not that there is an inherent fashion which is supposed to be good. Oh, this is what you should wear because it's the most convenient thing to wear. The measure of what makes clothing fashionable is precisely that it's being taken out of its utility. Fashion exists purely on the level of signification. Um, And so something is arbitrary because it's procrustean. And to say that fashion is procrustean arbitrariness is actually to say that fashion presents itself as something that escapes the confines of the bed and yet puts you inside the bed. This is also one of the reasons why a lot of fashion designers actually don't wear elaborate fashion designs. They wear like white t-shirts, essentially. They've like created their own procrustean bed. And the idea of fashion is specifically to give you a sense of being able to stretch outside of the procrustean bed, but in a very clever way, that is exactly the confines of the bed. Now, this isn't to say that fashion is a bad thing, in a sense, but fashion commoditizes the experience of being outside the norm. That's the whole point of fashion. And in a sense, that's what makes fashion an art form because it wrestles with the tension between form and content. It overexposes, in a sense, the content in the form. Because to be interested in fashion is not to be interested in the utility of what you're wearing. It's specifically to be interested in the way you're playing with the idea of utility itself. And this is also why if poetry is a form of torture, it's specifically a form of procrustean torture which isn't to say that poetry is arbitrary, but it's to say that poetry is simply the process of language bending in on itself, becoming self-aware of being language in a sense. That is the experience and the titillation of poetry. It is language, not just having the use value of language, but specifically finding some new creative form in this new thing that emerges, in, in the uncanny content, the unconscious of language breaking through. You could say that fashion is the unconscious of clothing breaking through and making itself manifest in that sense. And so what's really kind of an... I don't know. Have I totally lost everybody here? No, no, no. no, I'm with you. Okay. It's all sort of coming together. (laughs) Now, what's important here is that we have... Actually, you know, I mentioned three people. I said Susan Zontag. I said Paul Salon. And I mentioned Tolkien. And we never really talked about Salon. And Salon has this interesting idea, which is he says that as soon as you put... He's he's being very different from Derrida here, which is kind of interesting, right? For Derrida, nothing exists outside the text. It's one of the classic deconstructionist things. For Salon, it's very much the opposite, which is that the only thing that exists is... No, no, let me... I don't want to be, like, too fancy here. Let's just go with what Salon said. Salon has this beautiful expression, which he says that... Mm -hmm. Words have no meaning. Words are a figuration, in a sense. A word is a stand-in for an idea. It's a symbol. And then the interpretation of the word becomes a symbol itself. This is still within the realm of Derrida. Salon is before Derrida, by the way. But he has this really interesting thing, which is very romantic. Salon says that 
nobody can believe that words actually have an inherent meaning, except the words themselves. And this is really, really interesting because what does he mean when he says except the words, the words themselves? How can a word believe in its own content? And it's because what he means is that when a word exists on text, it's existing in the unconscious space of the word. In other words, it is not being interpreted yet. It exists as pure potential. And in order to exist in that space, there was no primordial word that was expressed. The writer wanted to express something, didn't know how to express it. In a sense, again, writing is a form of failure, right? If I could express it to you directly, I would. Instead, I have to sign symbolize it, signify it in a letter, in a word. And as long as it exists on paper, it exists in this space before interpretation by somebody else. And that's like a pure space, but it's also a space that specifically doesn't exist. It's like the unconscious space of the language itself, because the only reason it exists there is because of not being able to be expressed in the first place and it will be interpreted. And, and so long as this beautiful image, which is that, and I mean, we can talk more about this in the bonus is that you can, he talks about carving out a grave in the sky because in the sky, at least you're not constricted. And this is, in a sense, what Lacan would also call a floating signifier. A floating signifier is dead, but not constricted, if that makes sense. And to imbue the floating signifier with meaning is to imbue everything else with meaning. We're getting very metaphysical here, but like, we can talk about this in the bonus. I do a one-hour bonus Q&A with you guys on Discord afterwards, so we can, we can go more into detail on poetry and stuff like that. Okay, so why are we talking about all this stuff? We've done a whole bunch, right? We've started with... Freud's idea of the unconscious, Lacan's idea of the unconscious, Marx's take on religion, Marx's take on the commodity fetish, how the commodity fetish relates to the unconscious. We talked about three stories, the purloined letter, Maupassant's The Necklace, P.J. Wodehouse, Agath Agatha Takes Count. We've, we've, we talked about all this stuff. And uh, what I'm trying to get across here, and you, you may already suspect this, is that there is something similar that happens in the Marxist and the Freudian hermeneutic key, which is to say this. In the previous classes, we pointed towards that we fact, the fact that we have to resist the hermeneutic temptation. In other words, the temptation to read meaning into everything, to say this means this. One thing symbolizes something else. And what Marx and Freud both do is that their analysis rests on the idea that there is always a latent element within the thing itself. In other words, that there is a disavowed component within the thing that contains its true meaning. More importantly, that we can't just dig into that meaning, but that that disavowed component, whether it's the fetish in the commodity fetish or the unconscious within the Freudian consciousness, is something that emerges specifically because it's not supposed to be there. It's the disavowed element. For Lacan, it's the discourse of the other. It's emerging through social relations itself. And so the important point here, and we're going to continue this in the next class because we're working towards it, is specifically to say that we don't structure it. We don't structure our unconscious. We don't structure the whatever. It structures us. We don't structure language. Language structures us. Subjectivity is a retroactive effect of that which we perceive to be lost. And so, in a sense, the empty space, whether it's the purloined letter, whether it's the missing pearls, whether it's the fake pearls, those seem to have no value. And it's precisely because they seem to be empty that they're the thing that drives everything else around it. And it's that empty space that is, in a sense, revolutionary. That empty space that is constitutive negativity from a perspective that Jizek would usually use. And so, what we're setting up here is a sort of a... a an, I wouldn't call it an analogy, but a similarity, which Zizek has pointed out also in, this, I think it's in the sublime object of ideology, a congruency between the Marxist and the Freudian hermeneutics and how those two, when brought into conjunction, can actually provide us with a possible, I wouldn't call it a solution, but at least a, a, a form of relief from the hermeneutic temptation. Which is also a long way of plugging my book. I'm going to be releasing a book at the end of October called The Hermeneutic Temptation. 
uh, where, ever, where all of this will be written down in more detail. Uh, that's going to be coming end of October, and you, you can basically pre-order that on my Patreon. That's my plug. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for watching today. Um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like that resolution may not have been, like, bombshell resolution, but we're working towards something. And, and if you have the time and the patience, and if you want to inflict that particular kind of torture upon yourself, <laughs> please consider going back to the previous classes where you will find these ideas refracted. I want you to keep in mind that these classes are specifically not taught in a chronological order. They're not one, two, three, four, five. Instead, you should be able to start here and work your way through it in any way. They are dialectically uh, constructed, as it were. Not that I like sit down and map it all out, but but that's sort of how they how they get around. Um, someone in the comments wants to know more about violence uh, and Jizik. Uh, I've done a lot of actually about Jizik's theories of violence. Uh, so if you dig deep into the classes, you'll find that. Or you can join our Q&A on Discord and you can ask me anything and I'm happy to join. For now, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you, Jenlene, for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Uh, Jenlene is still taking a hiatus from teaching, but you are welcome to join us whenever you feel like it. <laughs> thank you guys for watching wherever you're joining us from, wherever you are in the world. We hope that you're having a good start to your week. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope that you're having a wonderful time. If you'd like for us to teach at the University of Chicago, just send us an invitation and we will make our way to Chicago. <laughs> uh, we're always happy to go places. Uh, especially now that things are opening yes. up again. Yes. And uh, by the way, I'm saying this because of the comments. It's not like I'm just like projecting <laughs> Chicago onto people. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. It's been my absolute pleasure to host this class. We're going to be taking a five minute break and then we're going to continue this discussion uh, for another hour on Discord. If you'd like to join that discussion or if you'd like to join, uh, if you'd like to download all of our bonus episodes to. Uh, on podcasts, as podcasts, to mm -hmm. whatever, please go to Patreon. There's a link in our Instagram about page and on our YouTube about page. Starts at just $5 a month. And your financial donations make a huge difference in keeping these classes free for everybody else. So a big thank you on behalf of our global learning community to um, to all of those who, who so generously support the Patreon. Uh, we love you all, and we're very, very grateful to have you in our community. All right. Big love to everybody. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time to have you here this morning. And we will see you in five minutes. If you'd like to join that discussion, send us a DM and we'll help you get set up. All right. Bye, guys. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Have a good week. And we're out.